Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel and as a podcast from wherever you get your podcasts from. And remember, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And joining me today is co-founder of Emerging Civil War, historian and deputy director of education at American Battlefield Trust, it's Chris White. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. And today we will be discussing the Second Battle of Fredericksburg and the Battle of Salem Church, which took place in early May of 1863, which formed part of the Chancellorsville campaign. And of course, it is the 160th anniversary. OK, Chris, let's start with an important thing that takes place, and that is the replacement of Joseph, uh, sorry, Ambrose Burnside with Joseph Hooker. So tell us about the decision behind why he gets replaced and you know, Hooker really breathes life back into the Army of Potomac. But just explain a little bit about that, please. Cheers. Yeah, the um, you know the Second Battle of Fredericksburg took place, and I call it a campaign within a campaign. It's during the Chancellorsville Campaign of 1863. Um, so when we get into that, it, there's a lot of moving parts to Chancellorsville, and and it really could have been uh, Joe Hooker, who's on the right of the screen, uh, his shining moment. Uh, but in Jan January of 1863, Ambrose Burnside, one of his great rivals within the army, uh, Burnside's on the outs with almost all of the high command. Uh, Burnside is the shortest tenured commander of Abraham Lincoln's principal army, and that's the Army of the Potomac, and he is in charge for a mere 77 days. He's uh, uh, replaced about a week from uh, now, from when we're, we're actually recording this, uh, will be the 100th 160th anniversary of that. Uh, but Burnside is a very affable guy. He, he's uh, a guy that you probably like to have a coffee with, get to know, but he's not a man you probably want to follow into battle. Um, he leads the Union Army at one of its greatest debacles, and that is the First Battle of Fredericksburg, which took place between December the 11th and December 13th of 1862. And in the wake of that campaign, um, he is going to try to undertake a second campaign, and that will be um, to try to take on Robert E. Lee before January 1st of 1863. Burnside has this mandate from Lincoln. He needs to win victories before January 1st of 63 because that's whenever the Emancipation Proclamation will be uh, formally signed by Lincoln on uh, New Year's Day. Uh, but in the meantime, as Burnside's getting ready for a second offensive, uh, two generals slip up to Washington, D.C. Fredericksburg's only 55 miles south of Washington, and these two generals end up in the White House, the executive mansion, as they call it at the time, and they end up getting a, a meeting with the commander-in-chief, with Lincoln. Uh, and Lincoln immediately knows something's amiss. First off, they've completely usurped the chain of command. Uh, but also the, the fact that these two generals, one's a brigadier general named John Cochran, uh, another is uh, another general named John Newton, who comes comes into the story of Second Fredericksburg. Uh, they both show up. They're tell, talking to the president. And basically, they're saying that we have no faith in Burnside. Um, and right before Burnside's going to undertake this next campaign, he's told by Lincoln, you might need to come to the White House. We need to talk. And Burnside is told that two general officers came to, his, to, to the executive mansion. Lincoln won't tell him who. Burnside, all he has to do is actually see who had passes that day to head up to Washington. He figures it out quickly, and he's a man who's just incensed. Uh, a few more weeks go by. And he gains Lincoln's trust once more, and Burnside undertakes another campaign. Uh, but unfortunately, as he starts to move around Robert E. Lee's left flank, rains and snows come across the Rappahannock River Valley. It turns the roads into quagmires. If you think about um, the First World War, First World War battlefields around Ypres and other places like that, that's what it's going to look like. Um, and Burnside gets literally stuck in the mud, or at least his army does. He's heckled by the Confederates from the far bank of the Rappahannock River, and this is all that the Army of the Potomac could take. It went from the highest of highs, being within seven miles of Richmond, in June and July of 1862. It was driven back to the front door of Washington, D.C. in August and September of 1862. Then it lost its beloved commander, um, George McClellan, on November 7th. Burnside marches it up against Murray's Heights at first Fredericksburg, and now they got him stuck in the mud. This army is broken. Uh, a lot of people call it its Valley Forge period, needing to put it back together. And all through this, Joe Hooker's been out for one thing, and that is the Army Command 
and also Joe Hooker. Um, and Hooker had been, you know, talking a big game since first bull run, first battle of Manassas. And he finally gets his opportunity in late January of 63. Lincoln sends him a letter, essentially says, you know, you've been running your mouth a lot. You say we need dictatorship in this country. You win victories. I'll risk that dictatorship. And Joe Hooker takes over a very broken army with a very broken supply system and very low morale. And uh, it's a turning point uh, that in the Army of the Potomac's history. Yeah. And again, his overconfidence. So does Lincoln like this overconfidence that Joe Hooker has with himself? I personally think that Lincoln likes Joe Hooker because Joe Hooker's a character. When people ask me who I will have dinner with, um, you know, and I, uh, from us from history, specifically the Civil War, I always tell them I want to sit down with Joe Hooker, Dan Sickles, and another guy named Dan Butterfield. I won't believe a word that comes out of their mouths, but they're entertaining. Um, you know, they're all compulsive liars, they're braggarts, but you know, unlike the stick in the mud that is Stonewall Jackson, at least I'll be entertained. Um, now Hooker. You know, he has confidence. And quite frankly, uh, I think people really judge him only because of one battle, and that is Chancellorsville. And yeah, believe me, he he missed the mark by a mile. And he, he could have won many times, in fact. He almost essentially let the Confederates win, win that battle. They had something to do with it, don't get me wrong. But Joe Hooker uh, was one of the best division commanders in the Army of the Potomac. He was one of the best corps commanders in the Army of the Potomac. He was known as a fighting general. Um, he did run his mouth far too much, and he uh, bit off more than he could chew whenever he um, started down the road mouthing off about Robert E. Lee. But Hooker's the man that they needed at this time. His swagger, when he comes walking into Army headquarters, is a swagger that the Army of the Potomac needed. Um, they had confidence in, in George McClellan, be it misplaced or not. They didn't have a lot of confidence in Ambrose Burnside, and they didn't know what to expect from Joe Hooker. The guys who were in the West Point classes with Joe Hooker were like, this ain't the guy for the job. But over the first few months of his command, he, in fact, put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's turn our attentions to the Army of Northern Virginia and Robert E. Lee. So, obviously, they've had this massive victory at Fredericksburg. So what what do they do in between that time? Do they just stay in the in the in the area and stay in there, you know, in in the area of Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg area? Uh, what do they actually do over that winter? So Robert E. Lee, it's an interesting case study. Most people today using presentism look back on Robert E. Lee and say, wow, that's his best victory at Fredericksburg. Um, but in fact, if you look at the papers at the time and you look at what Robert E. Lee says after the battle, he's very depressed because he could not land the killing blow on the Union Army. That's what he's always going for. It's what we would call today the War of Annihilation. Um, you know, Carl von Clausewitz will, will give us some of that terminology. Um, we're not using that terminology yet in the American Army, but he always wants to go for that killer blow. And Lee is unable to land that blow at Fredericksburg. And after Chancellorsville, you know, he's going to say he was depressed after Chancellorsville because he can't land that killing blow. And then, in fact, if you read the Confederate papers, specifically in Richmond, they were not always fans of Robert E. Lee in his own time. And they're going to start to complain that, look at Lee, he could have had this great victory at Fredericksburg. He could have destroyed the, the Federals. And, and honestly, it's not the case. The, the Federal artillery um, would have just had a reverse Murray's Heights if the Confederates came out from their fortifications or from behind the stone wall and gone across that 900 yards of open field towards those Union guns. It would have probably been a role reversal, and Lee knows that, and that's what kind of upsets him. Now, fast forward to later in the winter, Lee's stuck uh, on the banks of the Rappahannock River. The bulk of his army will be stationed around Fredericksburg, but then he's going to spread it out for more than 35 miles. It'll go to the kind of the northwest along the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers, and that will cover fords like Ely's Ford, Banks's Ford, U.S. Ford uh, to the north, northwest. And then his army will spread out south towards a place called Port Royal. Uh, real Civil War losers like me no Port Royal because that's where um, the assassin John Wilkes Booth is, is captured and killed. Um, but that's spread out for 35 miles. Lee also is going to send um, two of his divisions down to George Pickett's and John Bell Hood's divisions under the command of uh, his second in command, James Longstreet, down towards the Norfolk and Suffolk, Virginia. Today it's about a two and a half to three hour drive by car, uh, unless you're on 95 and it could take you between two hours and two days to get there. Uh, but the 
Lee has a supply problem. Um, number one, the, the problem is that he has the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. It's a one rail line that is going to bring supplies from Richmond up to Fredericksburg, and it terminates on the Potomac River, just like it names implies. But Lee has in Richmond a terrible supply officer named Lucius Northrop. Uh, he's not good at his job. In fact, there's food rotting in, the, in, in Richmond at times. There's things just backed up. When people complain about the Confederacy not having enough food stores or uh, shoes or things like that, well, most of the time it's logistically they can't get them to the front and they do have these things. That wartime suffering will go on later on, but at this time they still do have, um, you know, a, a, a decent amount of supplies. They just can't get them to the front. Lee also has a problem that a guy named Samuel Ruth is running the railroad, and he is, in fact, a Union spy. And then on top of it, the two armies are like locusts, uh, the Union Army and the Confederate Army. They're going to sit in Stafford County, the Union Army, the Confederates will be in Spotsylvania County right across the river. And over time, they're going to deforest 25 square miles of Stafford County. They're going to start deforesting the Fredericksburg area. Um, one man said, one Confederate said that the bird known as the chicken is extinct in this region. Um, in fact, the Confederate uh, citizens are going to call their Confederate defenders lice, and they were tired of dealing with them, and they couldn't get rid of them, so, so they looked at them as lice. Um, so Lee is is playing uh, to the Federals' beat. Even though he's won the last battle, he's won the last campaign, because he has to send his second command, as well as two of his divisions, down to Norfolk and Suffolk, Lee is going to be outnumbered. Um, Hooker's army will number around 135,000. Uh, Lee's army between 60 and 65,000. Uh, though in Confederate lore, he had like six guys, a horse, and two cannons, and he beat Hooker. Um, but the truth is, he has about 65,000 ish men uh, to, op to, to start off the campaign. So when the campaign starts, what he hopes is that he can recall Longstreet as well as those two divisions from that area and maybe some other Confederate units from the Richmond area to come to wherever the battle will take place. They never arrive in time, uh, but, you know, in the end, as we know, looking back, he didn't need them anyways. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, let's talk about the overall plan, because like you said, Fredericks, uh, the second Fredericksburg uh, battle is part of an, a campaign within a campaign. So just talk about uh, Hooker's overall plan and isn't it really the same plan as what the mud march technically was supposed to be or you know yeah burnside's mud march was essentially a flanking maneuver where you would hold lee in place uh south of fredericksburg he would send what would be what we would call a grand division to army corps roughly anywhere between 20 and thirty thousand men to hold uh, Lee in place while two more Grand Divisions swung around Lee's left flank and a fourth Grand Division would kind of act as a reserve. So Joe Hooker doesn't do anything spectacular here. I mean, in the meantime, he's going to rebuild the army. He'll um, get the supply system going. He'll get furloughs and then guys home. He'll install core badges, but he's not going to really outthink um, what Burnside did. So to, to make a very long story short, Hooker decides that he is going to send a flying column of cavalry around the Confederate flank that you see here. Their job is to actually break off into a few different ways. They'll call themselves a bursting shell, and that means they're going to go off in all kinds of different directions. He wants to head down to Gordonsville, Virginia area, down along the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, um, down to the Virginia Central Railroad where they intersect at Gordonsville. According to a sign there, this was allegedly the fried chicken capital of the United States, um, I don't know if it's true, but it was on a sign, so it was there. Um, then another portion of his his force will push on towards Richmond, cut the Richmond Fredericksburg Matomic Railroad, um, and then there's another portion not shown here that will actually slip down out of Stafford County towards Hanover Junction. So the idea for the CAV is to move out, disrupt communications, dis disrupt supplies. His infantry force will split into two distinct wings to start with. One wing, approximately 60,000 men under the command of John Sedgwick, will um, hold Lee in place near Fredericksburg and just south of the city, while a flying column of about 42,000 men will swing up and around Lee's left flank, utilizing some river fords, Kelly's Ford specifically, uh, made famous in March of 63 but from a battle out there, down across Germana Ford and Ely's Ford, and then slip into Lee's rear. So the idea is to hold Lee in the front, keep his attention one way, and then in from behind will come Hooker with his flying column. 
his idea is that Lee will either ingloriously fly, meaning that he will retreat, or he will uh, have to come out of his trenches and do battle. Um, and either way, they will defeat him, is what Hooker thinks. Well, he doesn't think of the third thing where Lee's going to come out and punch Hooker's army square in the face. Um, and that's essentially what happens. Mm -hmm. Okay, Let, let's move to Fredericksburg. Now, you did mention Sedwick, Sedwick obviously. Um, what is the decision behind Hooker wanting to send these guys down to Fredericksburg? As you said, it's like a it's a, a trick to try and trick Robert E. Lee in a way, I suppose, isn't it? But this explains a little bit more about who he sends and why he sends them all down there. Yeah, so uh, what he's going to do is around April 27th, well, to the 26th technically, he's going to finally bring together everyone and sort of tell him his plans. Joe Hooker never writes an official report that we've ever found for the Battle of, of Chancellorsville. And if you would ask him after the war, you know, what was your plan? And it would change from time to time and who you talked to and who you didn't talk to. Um, I think I, fought, I found an account years ago where he kind of pointed his head, well, it was all up here. Well, that's all well and good. So you can change the stories you need. But in real time, the Army of the Potomac is a little bit blind. Um, Abraham Lincoln's told him, please put in all your men in the next battle because, you know, George McClellan definitely didn't do that. Um, so he decides to split his army into two parts, uh, 42,000 men consisting of his 5th, his 11th, and his 12th Corps will move around Lee's flank. There'll be kind of an interim uh, area between the rest of the army uh, along the banks of the Rappahannock River, where he puts most of the 2nd Corps, and then he will send a portion of his left wing, and these are the commanders you see there, across the river at Fredericksburg. Their job is to go across the river at Fredericksburg and keep Lee's attention while Hooker comes in from the rear. And, and 60,000 men go under the command of the guy on the left, and that's John Sedgwick, 49 years old, West Point graduate of the class of 1837, and he is uh, from Cornwall Hollow, Connecticut. Um, he's a guy everybody likes within the Army, or most people like. He's very affable, um, has a great sense of humor about him. Soldiers really like John Sedgwick. Um, one description talks about him being as handsome, one of his staff officers being handsome as Romeo, and that John Sedgwick would wear an open blouse. Usually, he would have uh, pants that would go down over his cavalry boots. He's an old cavalryman, and then he would have spurs that he would always be wearing. Loved to play solitaire. Loved to joke with his men. But Sedgwick, this is his first battle. Uh, since the Battle of Antietam, where he was wounded three times on September 17th of 1862. And at that battle, he was a division commander in charge of about 5,000 men. Now, fast forward, he is here in April of 1863, and he's in charge of 60,000 men. Nothing's prepared him for this, and he is not the man that you want to be in charge of 60,000 men. Um, Sedgwick is every bit of George McClellan guy. He's slow. He's methodical. Um just just not the guy for the job, but he is senior commander. Then in the middle, you have John, John Fulton Reynolds, to me, one of the most overrated corps commanders in either army. Uh, Reynolds is uh, the first corps commander here, and Reynolds' first corps doesn't do a lot at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, in fact, they sustain about 200 casualties during the entire campaign. Some of them will cross south of Fredericksburg um, with Sedgwick's force on April 29th when they force a riverine crossing. That's members of the Iron Brigade. Um, and then they will be recalled all the way back around to the Chancellorsville battlefield, which is at least 30 miles on an exterior line of march. Uh, so they do more marching than they do fighting. Um, but John Reynolds is mostly known for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, where he should never have been as a wing commander at Gettysburg and getting himself killed. Um, on the right-hand side, you have Devil Dan Sickles. Um, Dan Sickles, not a West Point graduate. He's a liar. He's a braggart. He's a murderer. Um, he's a thief. Uh, he's a politician. Uh, so Dan Sickles, he's in charge of Third Corps. Now, looking over who Hooker has left over here, it's interesting. And we don't have a lot of evidence exactly why he leaves folks where he does because Joe Hooker, you can't believe everything he says. But to me, he has commanded First Corps before, Joe Hooker has, and he's served in Third Corps. So he's leaving two corps that he already knows. These are two known quantities. The Third Corps that he leaves over here, not meaning the Third Corps under Sickles, but the Third Corps itself under John Sedgwick is the Sixth Corps. 
And he's going to leave them as far away from Army headquarters as possible. And the reason I believe he does that is not because of John Sedgwick's seniority, but due to the fact that the general coup that took place against Ambrose Burnside started in Six Corps. Keep, he's already flushed out a lot of the troublemakers, but there's still some of them in Six Corps. So the safest place to keep those guys is as far away from him and the Army as possible. So that is one of the reasons I think Six Corps is over here. I think the first and third corps over here because he trusts them. He served under them or served as their leader or in the corps itself. Um, but again, with Joe Hooker, you never know a hundred percent truth. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's talk about the bridging process again, because obviously they've been there in uh, December. They've been through this before. Are they using the same pontoons? Um, so tell us about the bridging side of things this time around. And also are they using the same crossing points? So this is um, a pontoon bridge is something or a ponton bridge, which is technically there's no two O's in it. So it's a French term. Um, but in English, we call them pontoons. They go back all of the way to the time of Julius Caesar. He used them to cross the Rhine River um, during his conquest. So these aren't new. And, and what a pontoon bridge is, is simply a temporary bridge. It's not the boats that uh, hold it up uh, kind of act as the trussles of the bridge. And they're not, these boats are not meant for speed, they're meant for buoyancy. They're all meant to hold up a lot of weight. So these boats will be placed in the river, you'll turn them sideways like you see here, they'll be anchored down, and then you'll put trusses and wood planking and everything right across the top of this bridge. And the bridge that you're looking at on the right, that's from Franklin's Crossing. This is specifically where the major crossing will take place for the the Second Battle of Fredericksburg. It's on a bend in the Rappahannock River, simply called The Bend. And then on the left-hand side is a three-quarter scale uh, representation, a reproduction of what a pontoon bridge would look like. Um, these are placed in the water by specialized construction troops uh, known as engineers. We would call them combat engineers today or anything else you could think of. Um, and they are, in fact, basically the same bridges that were used during the Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, the crossing point at the lower crossing site that they use um, at the bend is basically the same crossing point that um, is used during the second battle or the first battle of Fredericksburg. But the engineers are very busy during this campaign. They lay in pick up around 36 bridges. Um, they'll be the same bridging materials, but they'll have to lay them at different points. So there'll be a bridge at the middle crossing site, um, which is at uh, the ferry farm, George Washington's ferry farm. And there'll be this crossing site down here, um, which were both used during the, the first battle of Fredericksburg. Um, the engineers that will place them here are the same New York engineers as well as the United States regulars. The only difference is they have a new commander, uh, a guy named Henry Benham. And he is a West Point graduate of the class of 37. You could throw a, a, a graduation party or a reunion party for the class of 37. Joe Hooker's in the class of 37, John Sedgwick, Henry Benham, uh, Jubal Early, Robert Chilton. I mean, you could just go down the line here in this army and see who are the two armies and see who, who served here. Um, but Benham took over for Daniel Woodbury, who was exiled to a place called Dry Tortuga, um, and which is down in the Florida Keys. It's also where Jefferson Davis will be th- uh, sent at one point, I believe. Um, he's at Fort Monroe, and I think he ended up at Dry Tour too. Go, don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, there's Henry Benham on the right, David Russell on the left. Benham is um, uh, taken over for Woodbury, and Benham is just a raging alcoholic. Um, in the midst of this campaign, he's worried because the Confederates are along the riverbank, and and. To make a very long story short, the Union soldiers decide that they're going to go down to the riverbank on the evening of April 28th as quietly as possible, under the cover of darkness, and on the morning of the 29th, at first light, launch a dawn assault via boats. You know, think of Normandy, um, just on a much smaller scale without motorboats and Nazis. Um, So as these boats go across the river, um, Henry Benham, as these guys are getting ready to put the boats in the river, is drunk and he's riding up and down the river screaming at people that they're about to be murdered that these guys are are going to um all die as they go across this river the next morning and he was so drunk at one point he fell off of his horse cut his face um one man said he looked like a comanche because of the blood coming down of his face another said he was in a beastly state of intoxication um and this is not what you want to deal with uh and and benham tries to call off the assault multiple times and in fact, over there, David Russell, um, he's the one who put stops 
puts a stop to his shenanigans. And Benham knows he screws up. In fact, in the midst of the campaign, he goes and writes a 12-page report uh, about the actions down here. He should have been sacked. He wasn't. He actually survives this battle, unlike Daniel Woodbury, who was exiled after Fredericksburg. Um, so the, the river crossing actually goes very well. Um, on the morning of the 29th, boats are launched. Men jump inside of the boats. Union infantry, they well, row themselves across. They make a, a landing on the Confederate bank of the river. And they engage uh, troops from North Carolina and uh, Louisiana. And the Federals establish a, a bridgehead right around dawn. Uh, and the first field grade officer in the campaign for the Federals is wounded, a guy named William Irwin, going across these these um, this river from the 49th Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, let's talk about who's facing them. So over the river is Jubal Early, I believe, and, uh, of course, Lee's old, old uh, sorry, bad old man. Um, does Robert E. Lee know that this is a, uh, you know, a fake attack. This is a, 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 an attempt to get his attention away from Chancellorsville. And uh, also, you know, what is actually facing the uh, army down at Fredericksburg? So uh, Lee's army at this point, again, was spread out. Um, they're not 100% sure what's going on. And as the Federals cross here, uh, word goes back to Stonewall Jackson, who's at a place called Belvoir. Um, it's the Thomas Yerby house. If you've ever seen the picture of, of Stonewall Jackson, where he's faced kind of sideways, almost in profile, that's the last picture taken of him. And it was taken at the Yerby house. Um, so down to the Yerby house goes uh, some Confederate couriers. They tell Jackson that the Federals are crossing in force. Jackson then sends word up the chain of command to Lee, and Jackson also prepares for a counterattack. Uh, Lee, who actually has a really good sense of humor on him, most people don't realize that Lee has a good sense of humor, and he also has a volcanic temper. Uh, everybody's looking at the marble man, or the marble model, as he was known to his West Point uh, pards. Um, they always just see him as that. Uh, but Lee's an entertaining character. Um, and Lee... When uh, when the courier shows up at his headquarters, he's actually pulling on his boots and was uh, equipped something along the lines of, I was one wondering when you young men would come and tell me what all that racket's about. And, um, you know, Lee will take his time coming down to the river. He knows he has good defenses. He knows even if the Federals are forcing a crossing, it's going to take a long time to get, you know, 130,000 men across the river. Um, so initially, Lee and Jackson meet, and there's fighting along the riverfront between 54th New, uh, North Carolina, 57th North Carolina, some Louisianans. Um, the Iron Brigade comes across as well. Uh, but they notice, both Lee and Jackson do, that this force has forced a bridgehead. They forced a landing, but they really haven't gone farther than the Richmond uh, Highway, also known as the Bowling Green Road today, modern day route two and 17 down to Richmond. And that's the indicator that something's amiss. And then one of the most famous pictures to, to be taken in civil war history, two of them, in fact, are taken during the second Fredericksburg campaign. Um, and both of them are usually mislabeled. Uh, one is showing troops in a fortification in a field trench. Um, and, and a lot of people think that's Petersburg. In fact, was taken in April of 63 here at second Fredericksburg. Um, that, uh, yeah, that picture right there. Um, and when these fortifications go up, and the other one is the picture I, I think you'll show later, um, when these fortifications go up, that's the indicator that this force is not a threat. There are 60,000 Federals here, but not all of them are on this side of the river with the Confederates. Uh, in fact, only two full divisions, and then eventually a third division will, will cross the river, um, and they just sit and they wait. And then Lee's going to wait about 24 hours, a little more than 24 hours, before he moves his army. Uh, he gets word from Jeb Stewart, who's around Chancellorsville, and he says there is a force coming into our rear. Um, they engage with uh, another Confederate division, Richard Heron Anderson, and Lee puts two and two together. This force in my front is not moving. There's a mobile force in the rear. We need to move. So on the around midnight, of April 30th into May 1st, under the cover of darkness, AP Hill's division, as well as other divisions of Stonewall Jackson's Corps, move out to the west. Lee will leave behind roughly 11,000 to 12,000 men, a uh, little north of 50-some guns along a seven-mile line to defend his rear. That's 
confidence right there, not only in, in Jubal Early, who was Lee's battle man, West Point graduate of the class of 37. He is the junior ranking major general in the Army. Um, but Lee has a lot of faith in Jubal Early, and that'll come to show throughout most of the Civil War, at least towards the end of it. Um, and Early eventually has to be relieved of command, but you know that's in the waning days of the war. At this time, Lee likes him. He likes what he's up to. He's going to leave an aggressive commander who has a lot of experience um, in the Confederate rear. So his job is to keep an eye on the Federals. If the Federals do attack um, and push him from his position, meaning early, the, the goal is to either fall back to Lee's army, which is going to be around Chancellorsville, which is about 11 miles to the west, or they can swing like a door towards the south, towards Guinea Station, which is the um, railhead at this point for the Confederates, and that is their main supply base at this point, and it's also their main point of evacuation along the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad. Most people know Guinea Station because that's where Stonewall Jackson dies on May 10th. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about the other uh, picture in a minute, Chris, because... Uh... I did uh, plan to talk about those because they're fascinating. Um, let's talk about the actual Battle of Fredericks, uh, Second Fredericksburg now then. So there's two sectors. There's uh, the Mary's Heights sector. Um, so tell us a little bit about that sector first, please. So uh, over the next few days, what we'll see is uh, a series of miscommunications between the Federals um, and misinterpreting what the Confederates do. So as I mentioned, Lee starts moving the bulk of his army, roughly 50-ish thousand men out towards Chancellorsville, which is to the left of this map by 11 miles or so. And he um, engages with Joe Hooker's army on May 1st. As they engage on May 1st, Hooker, who has the initiative... He has better position than, than Robert E. Lee. He outflanks Lee. He has more men than Lee. Uh, he decides, Hooker does, to pull back to a defensive position around Chancellorsville. It's a mistake. We know it today. You know, we, we can dissect that for, for hours. Lee then, who always wants to be in, on the offensive, he's a hyper-aggressive commander, takes that initiative, and he'll carry that initiative from May 1st of 63 all the way up through July 3rd of 63. Um, so for the next few months, Lee has the initiative in the Eastern Theater of the War. And, you know, famously, Stonewall Jackson will launch his flank attack on, on May 2nd, and then there'll be a massive battle. The real battle of Chancellorsville took place on May the 3rd. In the meantime, uh, on this side of Fredericksburg, there's a problem with the Union communication um, near Falmouth, uh, which is just off the top of our map. It's a small, small town. Is going to be Hooker's uh, chief of staff, a guy named Daniel Butterfield. Uh, Butterfield, not a West Point graduate. Um, he's a rich daddy's boy who his daddy is one of the founders of the American Express Company. And, um, you know, Butterfield is just a nasty cuss is the best way to put it. If you're an enemy of his, if you're a friend of his, he, he'll go to the mat for you. Um, and Butterfield, even though he doesn't have military training, he is a pretty good chief of staff. He can organize things, but the problem is he is at Falmouth and to get to Chancellorsville, it's a 20 mile ish ride around the outside of, of Lee's army. And a chief of staff also should be, basically the the guy who can interpret what what the commanding officer is doing he's almost an interpreter for them um and hookers over at chancellorsville we have here at falmouth dan butterfield and then south of the city before this map takes place on on may 1st and 2nd south of the city by three miles is john sedgwick so to communicate with the main army headquarters and the left flank of the army it's 35 ish miles along a very tenuous line of telegraph and communications um which is not working very very well and by the time communications get from one to the army to the other it could take eight hours and the tactical situation has changed well on may 2nd robert e lee sends word through through his chief of staff a guy named robert chilton he's a terrible terrible general officer terrible uh, officer um he lost general orders number 191 he's the one i blame for that during the antietam campaign and chilton is actually going to misinterpret what lee is going to say to jubal early um lee's going to say something along the lines of uh, you know, if you're attacked here and you need to fall back, you can fall back. Uh, but what what uh, Chilton thought he said was fall back immediately. And that's not what he did. Um, that's not what, what Lee meant. 
And when Chilton shows up at Early's headquarters, Jubal Early, who's a season commander, also went to to college with <laughs> Chilton. He basically says to him, are you, are you serious? He can't mean that. And Chilton's like, nope, nope, that's what he said. Fall back, fall back. So Jubal Early being Jubal Early, he leaves uh, one of the borrowed brigades that he has, William Barksdale's brigade, behind because that's not his men. They're from James Longstreet's corps. So he leaves them for fodder and he starts to pull back. And Lee figures out what's going on, and he sends a courier back and says, no, 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 stop, get back into position, wait for a federal attack. And in the meantime, John Sedgwick is kind of sitting on his hands. Um, he, he launches a small probing attack, but eventually gets word from Joe Hooker that he needs to attack. And um, what, Hook, what Sedgwick's role for Hooker will be is a hammer. Now, what's happening at Chancellorsville is important. Stonewall Jackson has launched his flank attack, and Robert E. Lee is on one side of Hooker's army while Stonewall Jackson comes in from the other side. Well, Hook, but Joe, um, but Jackson's attack is not as impressive as some people think it is. Yeah, they absolutely sweep away the 11th Corps, but they come right up against the 3rd Corps, the 12th Corps, and he stopped cold before he's even wounded. Um, you know, the darkness will stop him. Everything else will stop him. But Joe Hooker needs help. Hooker, I won't say is panicked at this time, but he he now needs help. So what Hooker does, and he still could win this battle easily because he's got 90,000 men around Chancellorsville and Lee's got about 50,000. He calls back to Sedgwick at, Chanc- at, at Fredericksburg and he tells him to march into the city and take William Street, you see there towards the center of the map, which turns into the Orange Plank Road, and take the Plank Road to the west. He wants him to come in from the west and attack Robert E. Lee at dawn. And basically, the Anvil will be the Army of the Potomac at Chancellorsville, and the 23,000 or so men that are left, 28,000 or so men that are left at, at, at Fredericksburg, will be the hammer. As the campaign has gone on, I mentioned earlier the first corps does more marching than fighting they're on their way over to hooker's army the third corps which started on this side of the army has been moved over to the center of the army so sedgwick is down to one division under john gibbon from the second corps and they are there's problems there's a reason they're at fredericksburg there was a mutiny within their ranks so hooker left them away from the army and then there's john sedgwick and his twenty three thousand man six corps now if you read between the lines what has to happen is that around midnight on the evening of May 2nd into the morning of the 3rd, Cedric gets orders. His men are three miles south of the city. He is told to march into the city. He is to engage an enemy of unknown strength and disposition. He is to dislodge them. He is to march another 12 miles to get to Chancellorsville to then attack Robert E. Lee. And oh, by the way, he has to do this all before dawn. This just can't happen. It, it's it's ludicrous. Even if the communication was going well, this is this is ludicrous. One Sixth Corps staff officer will, will comment after the battle uh, something along the lines of what was Hooker there to do with his 90,000 men just to sit back and wait for the R23,000 men to come to their safety and be their saviors? And the guy had a point. So Sedgwick, and it's important to remember, the Sixth Corps never served at Fredericksburg. Uh, in the city specifically. Sedgwick never stepped foot into that city because he was wounded at Antietam, never fought at first Fredericksburg. He has no idea what he's getting into. When the army marches north, they're slowed by Benjamin Humphreys and his 21st Mississippi. Um, he's actually was kicked out of West Point. He's a character. He's about 53 years old, I believe, at this time. And, and, and um, he's going to slow down Sedgwick. Once Sedgwick gets into the city, it's almost dawn. And then they have to find somebody, and the city's largely deserted, and they, they find a black man who's in the city, um, and they turn him into their guide. And he's the only one leading the Sixth Corps through the city. Then, right around dawn, he's going to send an attack, uh, a probing attack, out towards the famed Murray's Heights, where you see Murray's Heights, 21st Mississippi Company, CFNL, Squires Battalion, or Battery of Washington Artillery. That's roughly where they'll attack, and that'll be the 60. Second New York, as well as the 102nd Pennsylvania, they go across this field and then immediately are riddled with bullets. They have no idea the Confederates are back there. There's some fog out here. The Confederates are tucked in behind that stone wall, and they pop up towards the last second and just 
lay down a devastating fire. 23rd Pennsylvania also goes up into there. So Cedric's like, okay, that didn't work. So what do we do? We look to the north. If you look to the top of the map, there's the name uh, Laughlin. That's Byron Laughlin um, and uh, Norman Hall. They're going to try to go across a canal that's up there, made famous. You know, everyone hears about this canal at Fredericksburg. Well, that's the canal. It's 15 feet wide, five feet deep, and has three feet of standing water in it. So you get across the thing. There's no bridges. Confederates took them down. Um, And since they took them down, they have to go to a barn. These Federals tear down a barn, lay down planking, try to cross. It just doesn't go well. And in fact, future Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. is wounded one of the many times he is during the war here at Second Fredericksburg. It's actually on uh, an American football field today uh, up uh, behind one of the schools. All right, that didn't work. So then we're going to send an attack forward across the open ground um, towards Murray's Heights. Um, this attack is going to go out and be pinned down. And that didn't work. The Confederates, even though they're outnumbered, they're in a strong position. They know this position. They've been there all, all winter. Um, so Sedgwick now is going to sit back kind of get a little angry. He pulls down his hat over his eyes, according to one man, rides back into the city, and they come up with a new plan. And the plan is is laid out here um, on this map. And you'll see the name Spear, Brown, and Burnham. Now, George Spear, he's the commander of the 61st Pennsylvania. He is going to lead his men up William Street. That's the main road that Sedgwick needs to clear to get to Chancellorsville. And oh, by the way, it's about 10 o'clock in the morning by now. Um, And the battle at Chancellorsville has been raging for the last five hours. And there's nearly 20,000 casualties at this point out there. So Cedric's behind schedule. Spear, he is going to pull together all of his non-commissioned officers, his corporals, sergeants, uh, and pretty much thinks this is a forlorn hope, puts these guys into a column, which is more Napoleonic than it is American Civil War. And he's going to go out the street in this column. Another uh, another column under Henry Brown will attack up um, uh, Hanover Street, and then a final column will attack more of a traditional style attack, and that'll be under the command of Henry Burnham, um, commanding what they call the Light Division, um, the 4th Division of the 6th Corps. And uh, John Newton, a federal commander, described this as two lances going forward up William Street and Hanover Street to pierce the Confederate lines. Um, the assault goes forward. George Spears is killed in the streets today near a uh, um, donut shop and a, a dentist office. Um, and then Brown's men are shot down as well. But attacking across the open field at Murray's Heights will be Henry Burnham's men. And Burnham's men will go across the field as quickly as possible. They will strike the Confederate line and then realize it's just thin. Um, there's one man basically every three to seven feet in this road because they're, they're under undermanned. And then the Federals will swarm in there onto that flank and then Spears men uh, and Brown's men will get up and start moving forward as well. And by 1130 in the morning, Murray's Heights falls. Um, but it is a it is a nasty nasty stand-up battle um and the confederates there are some accusations that there was this flag of truce that i don't find to be truthful that the the federals put up a flag of truce and then under this flag of truce they attack um and i I just don't think it holds water after everything we looked at Mm -hmm. are they contending with the artillery like there was in the first fredericksburg uh, from mary's heights this time around yeah, that's a good question. The, the, they're contending with uh, the Washington Artillery of New Orleans, Louisiana. The Washington Artillery actually were stationed almost in the same spot during the first Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, so if you see the names there, Washington Artillery uh, and Squires, that's one of the batteries. Uh, Parker there towards the 18th Mississippi, that's a Virginia battery. They're not Washington Artillery, but they knew this ground very well. At least some of the gunners did. Um, and the difference, though, is the Confederates have fewer guns than they did in December of 62 to cover this front. Um, to the north, you see the name Wilcox. That's Cadmus Wilcox, uh, graduate of the class of 46, West Point 46, um, known as Uncle Billy Fixon to his men. Wilcox literally marches to the sounds of the guns that morning. He's not even supposed to be here today, to quote Kevin Smith and uh, Dante and Clerks. Um, this is uh, Wilcox shows up to help hold that flank. 
And there's some artillery up in that sector um, that does pretty good effect uh, engaging with Adams and Hazard's uh, batteries down along what is today Washington Avenue in, in Fredericksburg, um, down towards what, what is Kenmore, which is uh, George Washington's sister's house. So the artillery plays a, a vital role, at least initially. Um, a number of the officers who are killed, uh, the description is that they're killed by grape shot. So when the Federals get close to the to the wall, it seems that the Confederates unleashed one last salvo, uh, and that will be their last hurrah. Um, the Federals will actually find a break in Marie's Heights. Marie's Heights is actually a series of five hills on the western side of the city of Fredericksburg. They're named after the Marie family who owned Brompton there, built circa 1824. And because they are a series of, of, of hills, there are breaks in these hills, and the Federals find a small break that's still there today. You can actually walk up it, and as they slip up through this break in the hill, when they emerge around the backside of the hill, in fact, they're in behind the Confederate batteries, and the Confederates at first don't even realize they're there, um, and they just basically go in all directions, these Federals, and that's what's going to uh, dislodge the Confederates. Once they pierce this line and they kind of spread out through these gullies, these draws, as we would call it uh, today, that's going to doom the Confederates on, on top of Murray's Heights. And there's no depth to this position. That's the other thing. Um, the Confederates do not have depth to it. They only have about 11,000 men who are com- trying to cover an almost seven mile line. Mm-hmm. And so is the Lees Hill sector the uh, s- a similar situation? Uh, part of the same attack. This one's a little bit different. I mean, if you see the arrows going in all different directions, um, you know, there's conflicting accounts even from the primary sources of which way guys went. Um, you know, I, I've had another historian contest, you know, some of the some of the ways these these guys went, and all I said was they were here. Here's the primary documents that we have, but. This one is a little bit different. Um, So Lee's Hill, which is Telegraph Hill there, it's known as Telegraph Road because there was a telegraph along it that would go from Washington, D.C. down to Richmond. um, And it came right through here in Fredericksburg. Well, Telegraph Hill was the command post of Robert E. Lee during the Battle of Fredericksburg, the first battle in December. So today we call it Lee's Hill. At this time in May, it is the command post of William Barksdale. It's a high hill. Today you can't see very far from it because of trees, but at the time you could see basically the open plain below you. And Barksdale will actually grumble at one point on the morning of, uh, I think May 2nd or 3rd, I can't remember which day, um, something along the lines of, are you sleeping, General? Someone goes to wake him up, and he said, how can you sleep with a million army Yankees around you? Um, and, and Barksdale will use that as his headquarters. And the the difference down here is Barksdale is from Laf- Lafayette McClaws' division of James Longstreet's Corps. Barksdale is a um, Tennessee native. He's known for commanding Mississippi troops. He's a lawyer. He's a politician. He's a firebrand. And he's a heck of an officer who has no formal military training. He has a good head on his so- shoulders. He reminds me a lot of Daniel Morgan from the first uh, from the American Revolution. But Barksdale's men are a little bit different because what happens is uh, when the, you'll notice that, that the Federals under Albion Howe um, they're st- kind of stacked up in, in three waves. Um, as these men start to go forward, in the center of the first wave was the 21st New Jersey, at least two battalions of it, and they had never seen battle before. And they actually slow down, um, which forces some of the federal units to go around them. And then the federals at the same time will start to see Marie's Heights fall. And they misinterpret which way they're supposed to go. So these guys will cross a place called Hazel Run, go down into Hazel Run, and actually come up uh, onto Murray's Heights. It's not designed to go this way. And in fact, as the 18th and 21st Mississippi start to fall and 17th Mississippi start to come out of the, the, the road, um, the um, – the the federals catch them unawares uh and that they're they kind of start to to cut them off and then in the meantime the remainder of the 21st new jersey as well as part of the famed vermont brigade will aim straight for telegraph hill as well as a smaller hill called hallison hill and as they go up that hill uh in fact the the hill starts to catch on fire there's a, a story about the 
the flames and smoke and everything, people think of the Battle of the Wilderness as being the battle that has all these these smoke and flames in May of 1864. In fact, this happens at many battles. In Chancellorsville, it, it happened as well. So it's a very sharp and quick action. There's one major assault on the Lee's Hill sector. It goes for broke, and they go across this field, hell for leather, and, and try back Barksdale's men. Now, by this point, this closing in on noon on May the 3rd, the major fighting around the Chancellorsville Crossroads is dying down and early is calling for a retreat back towards um, uh, back towards Chancellorsville, but more in a south uh, easterly direction down towards Guinea Station. He knows the game is up. Um, but this battle is is quick. Um, this portion of it, I would say, within 20 minutes, uh, the Maurice Heights is is secure. Thomas Neal actually rides up Maurice Heights and and captures a cannon alongside uh, another commander of the 77th New York. Um, Barksdale's men are dislodged, and and they have a big chip on their shoulder, a huge chip on their shoulder, which carries into the newspapers between Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. Because Barksdale felt that they got thrown under the bus by Early. Early blames Barksdale for the loss at, at Second Fredericksburg. Because remember, this is Chancellorsville. This is Lee's perfect victory. It's the best victory. Look, we're the best in the world. But don't pay attention to what happened at Second Fredericksburg because we really screwed the pooch over there. So these guys who weren't getting all the laurels because they weren't part of the flank attack and they weren't there crushing Hooker salient and doing these other things, they get into this battle so ugly that Lee has to step in himself and say, whoa, 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 guys, knock it off. Um, and, and that's what's leading into the, the Gettysburg campaign. But this this battle here, it, it's um, – what you think of as a human wave rushing across there, that's exactly what you get get with the, the Lee's Hill sector. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like you said, they uh, their objective is to obviously meet up with Hooker's army and they use the Plank Road. But along the Plank Road, they're going to come to a place called Salem Church. So tell us about what's going to happen at Salem Church, please, Chris. Um, you know, the Battle of Salem Church is one of these overlooked battles. Uh, that is Salem Church on the left. It's a congregation founded around 1844. Um, there's a, a congregation that actually splits into two. One, it goes down the road to Tabernacle Church, um, which is just down the road um, on the edge of the Chancellorsville battlefield. They were teetotalers. And then the ones here at Salem Church um, who are not teetotalers. Um, but this is really the story I think of one man who's overlooked in the Chancellorsville campaign. Most people who are fans of of Gettysburg know of John Buford. John Buford fought a delaying action on July 1st. He's a a Union cavalryman. He is going to set up a a series of outposts outside of Gettysburg, and he'll fight a delaying action until Reynolds' wing of the army arrives at Gettysburg. And and everyone knows John Buford. Well, on the morning of May 3rd, Cadmus Wilcox was up around the Rappahannock River, and he has kind of vague orders. And he hears fighting at Fredericksburg, and he marches his men to the sound of the guns. He gets there to uh, Early's left flank. He helps to block part of John Gibbon's division. And then he moves his men down without orders, really, to the main road, which is today modern-day Route 3, the Orange Turnpike or the Orange Plank Road, depending on what part of the road you're on. It has two different names. And he gets some of the 15th Virginia Cav. He gets some artillery with him. And he, with one division, or I'm sorry, with one brigade uh, of Alabamians, sets up a defensive line. And Sedgwick, in the meantime, who is slow as as molasses, um, rather than pushing on towards Chancellorsville, in fact, halts his men, calls up a division from the rear, and it takes hours to get moving again. And he calls up uh, William Brooks's division. Brooks is a Ohio native. I think he graduated in West Point of 41 or 42. He's, his nickname is Bully Brooks because he's a bully. Um, And Brooks is going to push forward, but meet resistance by Cadmus Wilcox. Wilcox will set up a number of defensive lines and fall back, fall back, fall back. And really, he has two choices uh, as he gets closer to Salem Church. He can fall back to um, the other church, like I said, Tabernacle Church, um, or he could hold the line here at Salem Church. And Salem Church is the highest point between this area, and the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, So you have to get all the way over to Europe to get another higher point. So he decides that he is going to make this his his last stand. In the meantime, 
uh, the chaplain of the 17th or 18th Mississippi rides into Lee's headquarters. And, and what's happening around Chancellorsville, Lee has reunited his army. That's something you have to remember about Stonewall Jackson's flank attack. Jackson left that army in multiple pieces. You had early at Fredericksburg, you had Lee between Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville with a force. And then on the opposite side of the federal army, you had Jackson. So Lee's army is in three distinct pieces. Hooker can still win this battle. And in fact, with the second Fredericksburg taking place and this battle here at Salem Church, Lee has to send troops off to the east. It's opening a perfect opportunity for Hooker, but he's wounded. Hooker's hit in the head. Today, we would know he would have a concussion, um, but nobody relieves him of command. He won't give up command, and he turns into a uh, sniveling cur, according to one of his men. Uh, another of, uh, accused him of being drunk. He was not. Um, he was severely concussed. He was actually almost killed twice during the battle, um, but Hooker can't take advantage of what's happening here at, at Second Fredericksburg and Salem Church. In fact, the battle is still not lost for the Federals, uh, but we know that it is today as, as historians. But Wilcox keeps falling back, and uh, Brother William, as he's known from, from the 17th or 18th Mississippi, he rides into Lee's headquarters, and he's in a panic. He's just – you can't talk to him, and he's flipping out because Early's falling back, and this is a doom and gloom. And Lee – this is a lot about Lee, you know. George McClellan couldn't size up an enemy to save his life. When Robert E. Lee took over the Army of Northern Virginia, or what he dubs Army of Northern Virginia, McClellan will write this idiotic letter that he would rather face Robert E. Lee because he basically is not the same man that Joe Johnston is, that he will fold under pressure. Talk about somebody not knowing, the, not knowing his, his enemy. Lee, on the other hand, could size up most of his opponents. And in this case, I think this is a perfect example. Lee, in the midst of this battle, at this high water mark, everybody's doing well. He's pushing Hooker's army back towards the river around Chancellorsville. William comes into this camp, flipping out, and Lee actually tells him to go sit on a log for a few minutes. The man calms down, and Lee walks over to him and asks him for his tale of woe. What's actually happening? And William goes into this whole thing, the world's falling apart, you know, all these things. And Lee stops him at the end, and he says something very telling. He says... Thank you for your report. I believe that Major Sedgwick means us no harm. And we'll see to him presently. And the interesting thing that he's saying there is Major Sedgwick, not Major General Sedgwick. Sedgwick served under Lee in the old Cav, in the second U.S. Cav. He knew the cut of his jib. He knew that Sedgwick was slow. He knew that he didn't have the killer instinct. And Lee knew that he had time to react. And that's exactly what he did. He sized up his opponent. He saw what was going on around Chancellorsville. He saw Hooker falling back to a new line, his final line there. Then he disengages troops from that front and marches men. You'll see the names Kershaw, Wofford, Mahone on this map. Um, those are from two other divisions. Uh, those are from Richard Heron Anderson's division as well as Lafayette McClaws's division of the First Corps. Um, Lafayette McClaws's division to me is the hardest fighting Confederate division at, at Chancellorsville. They saw action on all three days and did a great job. And Wilcox bought enough time and utilized the topography that was, was there in this Fredericksburg area. And once he gets to Salem Church, onto his flanks and into his rear start arriving Confederate reinforcements. And by the time the Federals are able to fully deploy for battle, they're now enveloped on both flanks. And the Battle of Salem Church is a real deal battle. It is a, it's a tough fight between both sides. Unfortunately, today, you would never know it. There's less than three acres preserved. The building, thank God, was preserved by the, the congregation, which is still an active congregation. They just have a new church they built in the 1950s. But if it wasn't for them, um, you wouldn't know there was a battle there. There's actually more more monuments to Chancellorsville of the campaign itself are actually to Second Fredericksburg and Salem Church than they actually are to the Battle of Chancellorsville itself. Um, there's only a handful of monuments there as it is. But this fight here showed that Wilcox really could read a battle. It showed that Lee could read his enemy, and it showed that Joe Hooker had given up basically the offensive, sitting back, waiting for John Sedgwick to come to his aid. And Sedgwick, 
could not fight his way through this this Confederate rear guard. Um, he misdeployed his men. He was moving too slow, and both Hooker as well as Sedgwick, you know, just blew opportunity opportunity during this battle. Lee and Jackson presented this soft underbelly of the Confederate Army to them a number of times. Hooker just never took the advantage. Mm-hmm. And again, what, what's the, so again, you know, this is a, obviously a Confederate victory, as you said. What is the reaction from Washington that Joe Hooker has, has uh, not prevailed here? <laughs> um, if there is a place worse than hell, I am in it, is what uh, Abraham Lincoln will say. Um, you know, Joe Hooker had done a lot for this army. He rebuilt its esprit de corps. He rebuilt it uh, morally, physically, he got them in, in great fighting shape. He reorganized it. He did everything right on that front until he made contact with the enemy, which is the most difficult thing probably in all of warfare. Um, after that, he lost the, he lost the confidence of um, Henry Slocum, who was the uh, de facto third in command of the army at Chancellorsville. Uh, Slocum, in fact, tries to lead a coup d'etat against him like had happened to Ambrose Burnside, and that's dangerous for an army. Once that precedent was set, um, you know, this could have been the unraveling of the Army of the Potomac. Luckily, other officers, cooler heads prevailed and were like, nah, buddy, we ain't doing this again. Um, but he lost the confidence, not of the army so much. He lost it of the high command. Um, you know, the problem that you have with the Army of the Potomac, as well as the Army of Northern Virginia, they are both within 50-ish miles of each one of their, their capitals. And who lives there? politicians and they keep coming to the front and they hear these tales of what's happened and they insinuate themselves to the army and and the governor of pennsylvania comes in and listens to john reynolds complain to him and then he goes over to, to george Meade and says basically hey i want to know what you have to say and then you know andrew Curtin, the governor stirring the pot and you know there's a lot of problems lincoln's at the front a lot which is acceptable because he's a commander-in-chief but you don't need all these these other people down there so joe hooker lost that confidence. Now, on the flip side, when you look at the average Union soldier, they're they're pissed off. They they knew they could have won this battle. the The Army of the Potomac was an army that was not defeated at Chancellorsville. When it goes to Gettysburg, it has a massive chip on its shoulder. A member, uh, Sergeant Bowen of the 12th U.S. Infantry, said something that, that always stuck to, stuck with me, and he kind of summed up the thoughts of most of the Union officers and men at chancellorsville we were we did not defeat but we were not defeated they looked at this almost as a draw hooker in fact wanted to pull back maybe get his army reorganized and push forward hooker or lincoln has to say no no you're crazy um we got to figure out what's going on here and in the meantime lee is not missing a beat um lee most people were thinking because of all the terrible civil war art that's out there that he's always all he's doing is mourning stonewall jackson that is not the case robert e lee in fact the day that stonewall jackson's put in the ground may 15 60, 63 in lexington virginia he's pitching what becomes the gettysburg campaign he's in richmond he's reorganizing the army the day after this campaign ends may 6th the campaign ends may 7th the next day he is promoting officers into divisional roles because he had had losses he is preparing to reorganize that army he is preparing to take the offensive he is not missing a beat so on the other side when you have hooker who now is facing a coup d'etat of his officers kind of like burnside was and we have them stumbling they've given up that initiative and it's just long enough that they give up this initiative that it gives gives um lee the opportunity to go north hooker prior to chancellorsville and during the campaign had a direct line to the president he actually jumped the chain of command there's a general in chief of the army a guy named henry halleck he's terrible at his job lincoln described him as nothing but a first-rate clerk and he's not even a good clerk um he didn't have to deal with halleck and halleck hated hooker and hooker hated halleck from from prior to <laughs> from from the antebellum years and after chancellorsville lincoln's like all right that didn't work you got to work your way through the the chain of command and halleck was laying in wait because he was just an evil man um 
and he's helped to set up Burnside for failure. He's tried to set up Grant for failure and he set up Hooker for failure for sure. Um, and, and Hooker, you know, the army at the core level still tr- largely trusted Joe Hooker, but he had lost George, uh, John Reynolds, Slocum. Sedgwick was thrown under the bus. What really upsets pe- uh, people in the high command is that he blames uh, George Stoneman for the loss. Uh, he's the in charge of the Union Cav, and there's some truth to that. He didn't handle the Cav. He wasn't the right guy. He blames Oliver Otis Howard. Um, I mean, Howard is pound for pound the worst Corps commander in the Army of the Potomac's history. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but he blames John Sedgwick, and that was the bridge too far. When he blames John Sedgwick for the loss, Sedgwick's Corps lost more men than any other Corps in the Army. They lost uh, about 4,300 men during the campaign. They had won the Battle of Second Fredericksburg. They had been stopped cold at Salem Church. They had fought in another battle called Banks's Ford that took place on May 4th. And they had created an opportunity for Hooker. And then rather than, you know, give Sedgwick his due, because later in that month on Harper's Weekly, the only bright spot um, of the campaign is a man from the 6th Main Infantry with a flag on top of Murray's Heights. That's the only great image and what does hooker do he's like ah the sixth corps didn't do enough for me and that just incenses the high command and, and that's where he really starts to lose the army fully lee on the other hand he's going for broke he's reorganizing and it's, it's time to go north mm-hmm. cool thanks for explaining that and again really hooker doesn't recover from that as far as eastern theater is concerned is it because he ends up in the west in the end doesn't he uh, no and i think that, that, and he, all that sort of place yeah, he ends up out in the West, and I think he gets a bad rap. This is where you know Joe Hooker has one bad battle, and that's what he's remembered for. He has many other good battles, and mm-hmm. out in the West as well. He yeah. also went at Lookout Mountain. He he's very active during the Atlanta campaign. Um, Sherman doesn't like him, and just as a huge slap in the face, he actually doesn't get Army Command of the Army of of the Tennessee when James Birdsey McPherson is killed outside of um, Atlanta in, in July of '64. In fact, Hooker, by date of rank and by seniority, should have got that army. Mm-hmm. And Sherman is a slap in the face, gives it the, the pious but vapid Oliver Otis Howard. And to show you just what what Sherman thought of Howard, he didn't put him in command because he thought he was a better commander. He did it to piss off Hooker, and Hooker put in his, his resignation. And to show you what, what, Howard, or what Sherman thought of Howard, when the Grand Review happens – he doesn't even let him march the head of the Army of the Tennessee. He he lets um, uh, Black Jack Logan lead it down Pennsylvania mm-hmm. Avenue. So, you know, that was just a, a complete slap in the face. But Hooker is a fine combat leader. He really is. He was just the Peter Complex. Uh, he was promoted one rank too high. And that happens a lot in the Army. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the photo. So we, you discussed that photograph, but let's talk about this one because this one is always mistaken for the first Fredericksburg for a start. And you also, you and Chris use this on your, the cover of your book, which we'll discuss a little bit in a second. But just tell us about this photograph, please, mate. Yeah, uh, quickly, this one is a wartime photo that was taken just in the wake of the battle, this was taken actually the same day of the battle. If we think of combat photography, this is it at its finest during the Civil War. Remember, it takes a lot of work to take a photograph during the Civil War. You have to set up a, a mobile studio. You have to have volatile chemicals that you're dealing with. Um, and it's it's not easy to, to set these up. But Andrew Russell, who's, who's a photographer for the Union Army, is following this core. Uh, the Sixth Corps as it moves forward. There's actually uh, a couple other pictures that are taken on top of Marie's Heights, a really cool one of uh, Zouave standing there, probably the 95th or 96th Pennsylvania. Um, there's a turned over case on. We have a picture down Marie's Heights uh, showing an old ice house where the Confederate tried to jump into and realized how deep it was and he had to be pulled out by two Yankees. Um, but this photograph is often mistaken for the first battle of Fredericksburg. It's taken in the famed sunken road. You can see the road here. The Confederate rifle pit is is right there. Um, and then on the left is the famed stone wall. The house that you see peeking over the top of the left center of the photograph, that's the Hall House. It is no longer there. That's actually where the Fredericksburg Battlefield Visitor Center sits today. Um, the Hall House was a wooden structure two and a half stories high that was turned into Swiss cheese during the two battles. It's so damaged 
that has to be taken down. But the, the photograph here is showing dead Mississippians in the road. So the Federals would have broken through just behind where this camera is taken or this picture is taken. And they've gone up on top of Marie's Heights, which is off to your right hand side. That is that's Marie's Heights. This photograph is sometimes censored because you'll see the dead Confederate there um, in the road. And um, sometimes he's there and sometimes he's not, depending on, on what photograph you see. But the bayonet at this point was used absolutely freely, they talk about. Um, this was a, a, a battle where, where some men from the 5th Wisconsin, as well as the 6th Maine, will describe it was the only time they saw the bayonet used. Uh, but it is a very brief time. Don't ever think of hand-to-hand combat like Braveheart, where they're going on for you know 25 minutes. It's brief. It's very personal, you know, and they they pull apart fairly quickly. But the Federals will run up over top of this. So this was taken on May 3rd of 63. It is one of the wartime photographs. I mean, and what's in here, I mean, you see uh, the Enfield rifle that's at the front. You can tell it's an Enfield due to the sights that are on it. Um, you can see cartridges just scattered around. You can see the Confederate with his leathers on who's who's been probably bludgeoned in the face um, because they, they also talked about using their, their guns as basically what we would think of as baseball bats or cricket bats. Um, and you could see just the debris of battle. And this is just about as real as it gets. This is uh, that now that soldier could have been moved because they do stage photographs at the time, but for the most part, this is probably one of the most straightforward photographs you'll ever see because Russell is following in the wake of this battle and of this um, this fight that's moving to the west, and and you know he's moving quickly because he's he's taking pictures uh, on the far side of the river prior to the battle. Then just after the battle, he takes this one, and then he takes more up on top of Murray's Heights. Uh, so this is a series of pictures not taken by Alexander Gardner or Matthew Brady Studios. This is a guy named Alexander Ru- uh, Andrew Russell um, who took these photographs, and these are available through the United States Library of Congress. Um, you can find them there or the National Archives. I can't remember which one. I think it's the Library of Congress. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks for explaining that. And again, this, uh, again, the pictures that they take during the uh, American Civil War really bring home to the people at home, you know, the horrors of war. And nobody's really ever had that before, have they? So that's that's one of the things that it, that it does. You know, it's horrible. Um, OK, let's talk about the uh, lost opportunity. At Salem Church, you did touch on it a little bit earlier. You mentioned it, obviously, in the book. It was a huge lost opportunity, wasn't there, um, in the 1970s, I believe. And obviously, because you work for American Battlefield Trust, and, and that's what you guys do. You know, you save this, these places now. But it was, a, it was a real lost opportunity, wasn't it? Yeah, we, we um, the American Battlefield Trust, I mean, we preserve land and we tell stories is, is what we say. And up to this point, we've preserved about 56,000 acres across 25 states in the United States. Um, now, we didn't exist in 1987. Um, we didn't exist until 1987. That's when we we're founded. But with the Salem Church area, you know, Fredericksburg is a bedroom community of Washington, D.C. People like myself, um, you know, have commuted from from there up to Washington, even though it's 50 miles away. And D.C. just keeps moving farther and farther south. If you've heard of Spotsylvania, Spotsylvania is not far from Fredericksburg. That's now a bedroom community of Washington. So, you know, it's a huge portion of urban sprawl. But there were two types of plans that were implemented. Uh, and th- this is a very long story, but I'll keep it a, a as short as possible, famous last words, I keep saying that. But there were two plans that came about after the Civil War for battlefield preservation. And by the way, we preserve more Civil War land in the United States than all countries of all other wars combined. So that says a lot. The um, There were these two plans. One's called the Antietam Plan, and one's called the Chickamauga Plan. So the Chickamauga plan comes out first. It's named after the first national military park in the United States, and that's Chickamauga Chattanooga out in Georgia and Tennessee. The idea was to save 8,000 acres and to basically put the battlefield back together like it used to. Um, Unfortunately, land speculators got wind of this, and the government was able to purchase about 5,300 acres um, of the battlefield. And by that point, you know, the land prices were jumping. We're talking the middle of nowhere, Georgia at this time. Um, so the federal government said, nah, that's not going to happen. We, we got we, we to gotta figure out a better solution. 
go to Antietam, one of the uh, Antietam National Battlefield. It's one of the first five battlefields that are preserved by the United States. And in the mid 1890s, they get this uh, superintendent. Um, I believe his name is last name is Dixon. No, it's Davis. Davis. Um, he's a, a Civil War veteran, but he's still in the army. And he decides he's going to save the federal government money rather than buy the entire battlefield. This will always be farmland. So how about we buy lanes because we will buy roads and we'll buy maybe 20 feet off of either side of the road. We'll put signs up and, and we'll put up, put, put up these signs and they're still there today. You can see them at Antietam, but we won't preserve anything else um, because this will always be farm fields. And so Fredericksburg, when it was founded in 1927, that was the idea. It was basically founded under the Antietam plan where we'll buy strips of land and put in roads. In fact, the congressional study that was undertaken to create Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park um, did a study of the four major battlefields there, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania, and Wilderness. And uh, the first study said, eh, we only need to save 1,500 acres, and we don't need to save anything in Chancellorsville. Uh, somebody thought better of that, and they said, we'll up that number to 2,500 acres, and we'll include Chancellorsville. Well, over time, Throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, if you read the correspondence of the superintendents at Fredericksburg, they see problems coming. They know the urban sprawl is coming. I-95, Interstate 95 is coming through. And this is going to change the whole community, and that's what happens. So there was an opportunity for the park to acquire Salem Church, and they turned it down. Now, this is not the only time that they've done this in their history. And, you know, you there were a lot of factors at play. It wasn't just short-sightedness because uh, that's oversimplification. There's money involved, there's politics involved and other things, but they turn down bringing in more land around Salem Church. They have the church itself. They have about 2.8 acres at this point. Um, they have a couple of the monuments that were out there that were placed there by the veterans and that's it. And then the gas stations installed in the 1970s, and that just changes it. And then we have fast food restaurants come in. We have a CVS, and today it is surrounded by a, a massive mega church on one side of the road, a Texas roadhouse on the other, down the road a little ways. There's a gas station, everything else, fire station down the road. And it's what I call a dead battlefield. So the members who created what becomes today, the American Battlefield Trust, were some of them were historians in that area. It was the 1980s. They saw the sprawl coming through, so they wanted to do something. So they created a private organization, a nonprofit, to help preserve that land. And that's what we, grown, we have grown out from, uh, literally from someone's living room into Arbuckle's restaurant, and then, which is no longer there in Fredericksburg, and then today into um, 56,000 acres and growing. Um, but Salem Church is a, a battlefield that I think you can learn a lot from when it comes to the battle itself, as well as preservation. And I like taking people out here to show them what could happen if we don't preserve this land. Um, it's a great case study. Some people get very angry about it and say, oh, you shouldn't waste your time there. But once you take people there and show what could potentially happen, and we're not anti, um, we're not we're not anti expansion, and we're not anti development. But it's just where do you put things in? Is you know, do you level a historic battlefield? Do you level a historic building? We hope that you don't, and and that's kind of what we do here. But Salem Church is a perfect example of a, a lost battlefield. Yeah, I completely agree. And I've stood on that spot where Salem Church is, and that road, man, that is busy. Yeah, I mean, I, I refer to, you know, there's the Taco Bell down there. That's roughly where the turn Turnpike House used to be, uh, the Toll House where the Turnpike, you know, I have to use the Logan Steakhouse as an artillery position. And people at first laugh when I'm doing this until I get them onto the battlefield. And then they're like, well, mm -hmm. he wasn't kidding. <laughs> no, no. And um, so lastly, let's talk about um, your amazing book that you and Chris wrote, because I know you put a lot of time and effort into this, didn't you? And am I right in saying this was your first, book chris um this was a seven-year book it was not our first book in fact um uh, the last days of stonewall jackson um was our first book that we did together chris was chris is a massive uh, stonewall jackson fanboy um which i relentlessly tease him about um and and so in the midst of that we were 
working on Chancellorsville's Forgotten Front. And um, it was a story that caught my eye for a couple of reasons. But, uh, you know, not many people have written about it. Uh, Philip Parsons has a book, and ironically, he was put writing his right at the same time as ours. There's no book about it for decades and decades. And then he's working on one, and we are too. Um, but this came out right at the 150th anniversary. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually looking to work on a second Vol or not a second volume, a second edition of this book, um, because legitimately the day that it hit bookshelves, I had very kind people walk up to me saying, "Hey, here's my ancestor's diary that was up here, and hey, here's this, here's that." You know, partially I'm like, "Son of a bitch!" Yeah. <laughs> like I wish I would have had that. And the other part of me is like, "This is really nice of them to to bring to us." So we've we've uh, um, you know collected more information over the years which is which is nice but yeah this was our first big book is how I put it um, yeah. this was our first hardcover book that that we produced um, by this point I think we had last days of Stonewall Jackson simply murder the Battle of Fredericksburg I think we also had a uh, season of slaughter which is uh, Spotsylvania and then I think this this book came out um, it was a busy basically three years for us but this was seven years in the making. Yeah, and again, you put a lot of uh, love and attention into this book, so uh, it's, it's, it's one of my favourite books, I must say. Um, and I will just say to everyone out there, like Chris said, there's not much out there on the Second Fredericksburg and Salem Church, so if you're looking for something, please go and get this book, because it's amazing. Well, Chris, all that's left to say is thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciated your time, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Oh, thank you for having me. Cheers. <laughs>